Hello and welcome to another day on Cornwall Pocket Farm where I try and figure out how to live sustainably on 300 square metres in the city. Well you've probably guessed that I am in my sewing room stroke uh, YouTube studio um, because it is horrible weather. All week we have had gales, it's blowing a gale, pouring with Ryan and yes, very unpleasant outside. So I had great ideas of trying to sort of catch up with the gardening. But yeah, that hasn't happened because of the weather. So never mind. What I thought I'd do is actually talk a little bit more about what I was uh, chatting with James Shaw about in my last video. At the end of it, I was talking a little bit about um, how we bought the house, and we but we didn't get into too much detail because obviously his his visit was quite short, and I had some specific questions that I wanted to ask him. So anyway, I thought today what I'd do is just cover that a little bit more about how we bought this house what we actually thought about, what we considered, and also how we went about buying this house. Because it was quite a process, and the process changed. I started off just like anybody else would normally go and buy a house. And we tried looking and yeah, doing what we'd done all our lives really, and it wasn't working. So we had to sort of pull back, rethink, and have another go with a different approach. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about how we did it, really. First of all, what we did, probably what most people do, what we've done all our lives before now, was we wrote a list of what we were looking for, and we went on to, um, to trade me here is, is, is what we use. It's sort of where we have, um, I don't know, in the UK it might be like right move or places where it sort of aggregates all the places that are for sale. Um, and we went on there and we put in our search criteria and then anything that came up that looked quite pretty and seemed to meet what we wanted, off we went and we did masses of open homes. What people do here is, is, is often they'll like pack up all of their furniture, they rent all this new furniture to come into their home, they paint the house white, um, so they sort of make it look as good as it possibly can look. I, th I think the idea is that w when you see this house for sale, you can see a sort of a neutral home that you can maybe imagine yourself living in. And of course, it probably looks the best it is ever going to look. We go along to these open homes, wander around, and invariably, the house wouldn't be right at all for a whole range of different reasons. It would be, it would not meet any of the requirements that we wanted because of course what we were looking for was a home that had really good insulation, had great orientation to the sun, had double glazing. We wanted to find a warm, comfortable, healthy, sustainable home that we could uh, live in with, with low bills and, and that type of thing. In New Zealand, as I've mentioned before on my other videos, double glazing is not standard, certainly not here up in Auckland. And what we found was that double glazing really only appeared in houses that were on very busy roads. And there people would often have just replaced the windows that faced that road, they'd have got those replaced with double glazing, essentially just to um, keep the noise out, which of course double glazing does brilliantly. But for insulation, because it was only really on a couple of windows, it really wasn't doing much at all. If you put in that you want insulation, essentially all we found were rental properties. In New Zealand, there is now a requirement that if you rent your property, you need to have a certain level of insulation in that home. But if you own a house or you're selling a house, there is no requirement for any insulation at all. So the only time insulation is ever mentioned in an advert, or indeed by the real estate agents through the show homes, is if it's a rental. Lots of houses that I went to see and I talked to the real estate agent about insulation, they literally did not know. They would say, oh, I'll talk to the owner and get back to you. So they had no concept of whether the house had any insulation at all which I thought was a bit bizarre. But anyway, so as we were going out looking for a double glazed house with insulation, that was just hopeless. We weren't getting anywhere with that. The other thing I asked about <laughs> on a regular basis was uh, where the sun was and where what the soil was like. Again, most of the time, you know, if it was cloudy and you couldn't really tell, the, the, the real estate agent had no clue which way north was 
and of course had no idea what the quality of the soil was. So those two things were quite important to us because obviously we were planning to put in a kitchen garden and grow our own food. So we needed somewhere that had good sun and that the soil was quite good quality. We didn't want to find somewhere that was all boggy and really heavy clay or, I mean, that wasn't insurmountable. We could have done raised beds, that type of thing. The other thing that we found is we'd race off to these um, places to view them. And you'd get there and find that, oh, hang on a minute, we're at, this house is right next to the motorway, for instance. The motorway is hurtling past like a hundred yards from the house. And one of the things I really didn't want was anywhere that was near a motorway. Because if you look into the health impacts of living near a motorway, they are dreadful. I mean, honestly, just Google search it. Most people have no clue. It's not only the, um, obviously the the fumes and the you know the emissions from the vehicles, but you've also got the 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 noise pollution. You've got the runoff from tyres and things on the road and all sorts. There is a whole load of environmental impacts and health impacts from living next to a motorway. So one of my the things on my wish list was that. I didn't, I only, I wanted to be more than 500 metres away from a motorway. It's a little difficult when you get into busy roads that you could say were, you know, are de facto um, motorways, but if you put that requirement in, then literally you would find nowhere in Auckland <laughs> that you could buy a home. So again, we would go and we would find these places right on busy roads because we mentioned that we wanted double glazing or it was right next to a motorway or whatever. And, and honestly, the real estate agents just list that as like, you know, great access to the motorway, like somehow it's a benefit. <laughs> You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's very, very car-centric in Auckland and New Zealand in general. Now, luckily, we had done one thing right, was that we decided we were going to house hunt on public transport or on foot or by bicycle because one of the key things that we wanted was to live in a walkable neighbourhood. We wanted somewhere with great access to public transport. And so if we couldn't actually get to the house, we knew that it wasn't going to be a useful home for us because it obviously wasn't in a walkable neighbourhood and it wasn't near public transport. Another thing on our wish list was, well, wish list, can you have an anti-wish list? We also didn't want a property that had masses of accommodation for cars and that is very, very common here, as I say, very car-centric. We would go and there would be double, triple car internal garaging, massive, huge driveways that covered most of the section. So that's a problem because A, it was going to be of no use to us whatsoever. And, and so it was sort of dead space. And obviously driveways to get to those internal garages is really just covering useful ground to us, useful land that we'd paid for it's a huge effort to remove a driveway. So yeah, having something that was massively covered in driveway uh, was a problem. We were looking with a few different things in mind. One of those things was climate change and I suppose you could just wrap them all up into the future. When you buy a house it's a big investment obviously and for us, we were planning to live in this home for quite some time. So climate change was one of those things. What were the impacts of climate change? What was that really going to mean? What were the impacts? What would we need to do to sort of mitigate those impacts? And the other thing was the cost of living because essentially when you look at the way, you know, climate change and the impacts of climate change, the other thing that's becoming very apparent is that it will disrupt our sort of food chains and, and fuel and all those sorts of things are going to get more expensive and rarer and all those types of things. So they were sort of like a second criteria, but it was that sort of cost of living going forward. The other thing was that, you know, we're not getting any younger. I mean, nobody is. Nobody's getting any younger. So I was looking at the future in that as you, as we get older, what that might mean as well. So we were looking for something that had easy access. A lot of properties that we saw were on really quite steep slopes or they had steps or the access was really quite difficult. So we were looking for something that was 
relatively easy access. So we did sort of nickname it ZFF, which was Zimmer Frame Friendly. But, but the same thing occurs like if you, like recently I sprained my ankle. And so uh, when that happens, you're really grateful that it's quite easy to get into your house and it's quite easy to get to your bedroom and you know you can you can actually get around the other thing we wanted was a small house because there's only the two of us now and obviously we have guests and um, my daughter daughter number two stays over most weekends and that type of thing but there's really just the two of us on a, on a day-to-day -day basis so we didn't want anything big because the bigger the house the more it's going to cost to heat the more furniture you require to fill it, the more cleaning you have to do, there's more maintenance you have to do. I mean, obviously, a smaller house is easier to take care of, look after, and it's cheaper to look after uh, and maintain. So, so we only wanted a small house, and we wanted to make best use of that house. Um, the way we've done that is some of our rooms have sort of lots of overlapping multiple purposes. Our back room is sort of, we call it the room of requirements because it, it houses a number of functions and it works really well for all of those things in, their diff in its different guises, if you like. But we didn't want a massive house. Now the problem, of course, is that in New Zealand, it's probably a little bit like America in that bigger is better, it, it seems. So a lot of New Zealand houses are quite big um, and so when we put in that we only wanted two bedrooms into Trade Me very very little came up and so we had to actually put in that we wanted a three bedroom house three beds and upwards because that was the only way that we were getting enough hits to really sort of have something to look at so as you can see when we were house hunting initially there were a lot of issues and a lot of problems and the system that we have in New Zealand really wasn't working for us. We went herring around seeing all of these um, properties every weekend for quite a number of months before we decided that enough was enough, we were going to stop and be smarter about what we were doing. We had at this point realised that there were no houses in Auckland that were on the market or coming on the market that had the things that we wanted. We found that any house that professed to be sort of sustainable or eco or had any of the things that we wanted in that respect, they were all out in the middle of nowhere. What we wanted to do was actually have a brownfield site, and that's a sort of technical term for um, having a site that's within a city so it's somewhere that's already built on already in a built-up area rather than taking a piece of land that had nature and wildlife and things on it um, insects bugs bees birds and all of that and then cover that with concrete which is a negative we all actually need to figure out how to be more sustainable in the spaces that we already live, in suburbia, in our urban environments. How can we be more sustainable here? And this is, this is what we wanted to do. We wanted to figure out how we could live sustainably in the city, as it turned out on 300 square meters. But we wanted to find somewhere in the city that was in a walkable neighborhood, close to all the amenities. We wouldn't have to have a car, all of those good things. The dream that everybody has to move out to the countryside and set up a lifestyle block and grow all your own food and be terribly self-sufficient and you know and it sounds all very environmental and eco and all the rest of it but it really isn't it's actually the complete opposite it is not sustainable for us all to move out to the countryside and and sort of cover the countryside with you know lifestyle blocks because essentially we're pushing out a wall of nature and we're going to be covering all that space with human activity which is the last thing that we need to do for the environment so our big experiment was how sustainable could we be in an urban environment the place where most people live and and most people should live because if we all live here and we live as much space for nature that's the best thing for the environment, for the climate, for nature, for everybody really. And we came to the realisation that essentially we were going to either have to buy a section, a plot of land, and build a sustainable home from scratch, or we were going to have to find a house and renovate it. So we needed to find a property that was worthy of that renovation, if you know what I mean. So a lot of houses, as I say, they've all been tarted up for sale. 
So for us that was not going to work because essentially we would have to rip out all this new stuff that had been put in, even though it was pretty cheap and pretty rubbish in a lot of cases. We'd have to rip this all out to do what we needed because of course what we needed was to get at the fabric of the building and improve the fabric of the building. So essentially we were looking for something that was pretty run down anyway and in desperate need of renovation anyway. So those were our options, find a section or renovate. So one of the things we found quite quickly was that there weren't that many sections in the, the areas that we wanted, which was quite close into town. Um, and when you did find one, it was, it was very squashed in and not, and not that great a potential actually on a lot of the sections that we saw and they were quite expensive. So how did we do it? How did we find our house in the end? Well, I realized that the old adage you hear all the time, location, location, location. When you buy a house, that is what you're told. It's all about location, location, location. And I think what they mean by that is this idea of where it is, what suburb it is, you know, the, the, the worst house in the best street, you know, that is another thing that people say. The low, you know, if it's in a great suburb, then it's gonna maintain its value, it's gonna increase in value, and, and it, it's all about value. But I think in the 21st century, we need to redefine location, 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 because it is supremely important, but for different reasons than I think was originally intended. And my three locations that I came to realize were, the first one being location as in living in a walkable neighborhood. Living somewhere where you can access all of the things you need, schools, doctors, supermarkets, chemists, your work, all of those things, without having to get in a car to drive everywhere. Because obviously if you can avoid getting in a car, all that cost of owning all those cars, all the petrol costs, the maintenance costs, the tax insurance, you know, incredible costs that come with a car. I now know this because not having a car is very, very cheap. It makes a massive difference to your bank balance, I can tell you. So, the first one is location as in, yes, I suppose, what suburb do you live in? Somewhere that's got good public transport and you can walk or cycle or take that public transport to, to all of the things you need to access on a regular basis. That is the first location. The second location in my book is orientation, if you like, because the sun is a brilliant source of energy and it's completely free. And if you get a place that has great orientation to the sun, it means that you have really good sunlight to grow vegetables and to, you know, create a nice sort of environment in your garden for, for nature and also for growing food. It also means that you can use that sun's energy very effectively as a heat source for your house. And then the third location in our location, 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 I think is how is your house located for the impacts of climate change? Because certainly in New Zealand, I know a lot of people now have gone, oh, hang on, I hadn't realized this before. If you live on the beachfront, that's gonna be a problem. We're already in New Zealand seeing this sort of managed retreat where places on the, on, the, on the beachfront are either sort of saying, well, you know, you can't live there anymore or you're being washed away or, you know, you, you, need, to, you need to leave the, the, the beachfront if you like. We're also seeing situations where we're getting an awful lot more rain now. Like an example <laughs> outside my window. We're getting a lot more rain now and what that means is we're getting flash flooding. We're getting rivers that are bursting their banks and taking over their floodplains. And of course where houses have been built all through those floodplains, they're all getting destroyed and damaged and there's all sorts of insurance claims and whatever. And it won't be very long at all before those places become uninhabitable, certainly uninsurable. So you've got that the water impacts of climate change you've also got things like forest fires as the heat gets um, more extreme living in a, in a in a sort of a bush environment that might be a bit risky when i started to think about what could happen with climate change i certainly know that you don't want to be too close to water and 
I wouldn't want to be on any steep slopes where you might get landslides, um, either you're slo sliding down the hill or something up the hill is sliding down on top of you, or anything like that. Again, that's a, an impact of the water making the land unstable. So there are all those types of things to start to think about. So that's definitely the third thing, thinking about climate change and what impact that is going to have on your house. I mean, obviously all of these things are, if you're looking for a new house, what should you be looking for? Or what, what might it make sense to keep in mind when you're looking for a new house, shall we say? So how did we find our house in the end? Well, <laughs> I got quite technical about it. So what I did was I went to Google Maps on my computer. I found the area within which we wanted to live and it was like the whole cent sort of centre of Auckland if you like. I took a screenshot of that. I put that screenshot onto a slide and I locked it there. And then on top of that I used shapes and colours to essentially do a bit of a heat map. I don't know if you know much about heat maps but the idea is it's a little bit like that game, you know, like the, you, the, the, are you getting hotter or you're getting colder? Um, if you're getting hotter, you're getting, it's good, and if you're getting colder, you're getting further away. So what I did was I went in and I made these shapes and I had, I coloured them, and then I changed the transparency on those shapes. So I put the transparency quite low at about 10 or 20%, I can't remember now. And then when I put shapes over the top of each other, what happened was, the darker, if it, were, if it was like a, a, a red colour and I had lots of reds on top of each other, the very red areas were good. If I had blue, which was like the colder areas and there was lots of blues on top of each other, it was very blue and very cold. So I used these shapes to sort of highlight the good bits. You know, I highlighted the areas where it had little shops, the things that we'd want, doctors and um, libraries and supermarkets and chemists and all those sorts of things. I highlighted those as a warm thing we wanted to be near. I highlighted the public transport. I highlighted things like um, green space, somewhere, parks, those sorts of things, because those seemed like a good thing as well. Um, I blued out anything that was near sort of like lakes or you know obviously areas that were very sort of low lying things that were of higher elevation that was obviously warmer as well and by putting all these shapes over the top of each other i could find out the areas that were that, that we wanted to look in if you like so by doing that it became very clear quite quickly what areas were good and what areas weren't so good then what we could do is go into Trade Me and we would be looking at houses and did they meet some of our criteria but at this point our criteria were really quite vague because we'd found that the system wasn't working for us. So essentially our criteria was just our top price range really and anything that came up then which was under our top price range but was either a house or a townhouse or something that had some land with it. I say land, when I, what I mean by land is garden, some outside space if you like. So we then looked at everything that came through and looked at it, if it had way too much car facility it was taken off our list because we knew that that was going to be probably too hard to fix. Um, there were other things as well that were instant no-nos. If it was really steep and we could see that from the pictures, that was off the list. So the next step, once we found something that looked like a contender, was to actually go onto Google Maps Live, you know, the actual Google Maps, go into there, zoom right in and have a look at the orientation and have a look at the garden, you know, the land around it and see what the shade, if there was shading, if there were big trees that were outside of that property that were shading that land, um, looking at the things that were around it really, how far was it from a motorway, Did it? was it in our, our red zones if you like. And if it met all those criteria and it looked good on Google Maps, then we would go and look at it. 
and that avoided the problem that we'd had before where we'd go and look at a property and it was a uh, hundred meters from a motorway or you know it had a driveway that was like this or you know it had sort of massive great trees that shaded the whole thing or it was completely dark behind a massive house in front of it that shaded it from the sun or whatever it was all of those things could actually be identified on Google Maps and it was only at that point we would go and look at the house and see what it if it had potential. A at this point we knew there was going to be nothing out there that was going to be perfect. Well a long way from perfect. <laughs> we knew that there was going to be nothing out there that was going to be up to the standards that we wanted on insulation and energy efficient fittings and water catchment and all those things that we've got on our list. We knew that. So what we were going to look at was its potential, its potential for change and what it would be, what it would look like if it was done and how good that would be. But again, coming back to that location, 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 once you've got the location right, you can do an awful lot. And of course, once we'd realized that we needed to renovate whatever property we found, we dropped our top price because of course we needed to buy the place then have money available to do the renovation that we wanted but at that point we would have ended up with a house that was in a great location had all the access that we needed to the things that we wanted plus we could create a home that was warm comfortable dry healthy and wonderful to live in so we ended up with this place Initially, I would have preferred a bit more land, a bit more garden than we have. If you want more land, obviously your, your, your price goes up or you have to move further out. But we did find that even if we moved miles out, like a really a long, long way out, it, the price didn't drop that much. It was surprising actually when we, when we were sort of doing, we were exploring this and doing the research. Being way out of town, the prices were really still quite high. So actually it did make more sense to be closer into the city, have all the amenities we want, and of course the community. You know, if you're living in an urban environment, you have neighbors, which I think is great because you know, we get on well with our neighbours and we can swap resources. We have grass from that neighbour and we swap jam. And it's great because I walk the dog around and I can find things on the side of the road and, and resources that I can use in my place. So actually, I love being part of a community. Of course, there are the negatives as well. But that's where double glazing comes in. Because when the people over there, over the road, have a party, that's fine. Everybody else is like, oh my God, did you hear that party? It went on to three in the morning. I was like, no, no, it didn't hear it at all. Slept white right through it. <laughs> so double glazing does have really good benefits for sound insulation as well as the thermal properties, which is what we um, put it in for. If you're looking at um, buying a new house and you're starting the process or maybe in a year's time or two years or whenever you're, you're thinking of moving, start to think about those other issues because honestly you know you the old way of doing it where you see something pretty you go to the house you look just at the house oh that's pretty it's in our price range let's buy it and you don't realize that you maybe locked yourself into car dependency whenever your child leaves the house you have to put it in a car and drive it somewhere you know, you've locked yourself in to a flood zone or whatever it happens to be. You've locked yourself into no sun at all. You know, things that you didn't think about because the house was pretty. And they're brilliant at this in New Zealand. They make it look very pretty. They, you know, with the staging and people will flash up the kitchen and paint everything. Obviously, they want, they want to get the top price they can for their home. And so you need to think beyond that. Well, in my opinion, anyway, you need to try and think big picture outside of that. Because honestly, when you're inundated with water and you're, you know, your, your home's washed away in some sort of flooding disaster, you're really not going to be that concerned with whether you like the colour of the wallpaper in the lounge <laughs> or whatever it happens to be or whether the kitchen you know had a really great bench top. It's not going to matter on those sweltering hot days when you are absolutely boiled because the entire house is glass and it's got rubbish insulation. You know those things matter and those things stay with the house. Can you change them? Yes, but it's going to be expensive, but certainly something like um, having a hill 
collapse on top of your house. You know, you, you, you can't really get beyond that. What's going to happen through climate change is we are going to have more extremes of weather. We're going to have more extreme drought. We're going to have more extreme cold. We're going to have heavier and more intense rainfall events, which of course leads to things like rivers bursting their banks, occupying their floodplains, uh, flash flooding, ground instability, all of those sorts of things. And of course fires, um, certainly in Australia they've felt that a lot with, with forest fires, bush fires, well why am I saying Australia, I mean Canada, I mean you just name it. Canada, Spain, Italy, I mean so many places are having issues with fires. I've heard that we're expecting quite high temperatures this summer. I think that's a trend. I think it's not just you, it's everybody. And if you haven't felt it yet, you probably will soon. So it makes sense to really think about those impacts and what, what impact they may have on you and your home in the future. And if you're thinking of buying a new home, certainly have that as a factor in your thinking because you, you might thank yourself further down the track. Hopefully that's just given you some food for thought. Um, maybe it will help you in the long run or if you're looking for a house to buy, maybe it's given you some things that you hadn't been thinking about before now. And of course, if you've got any comments, any thoughts, ideas, experiences that you've had, things that I haven't thought about, please do put it in the comments below because I'm very interested in that sort of stuff, as you can tell. So hopefully next time we will be in the garden and the weather will get a bit better because it's a bit meh at the moment, but I'm very happy to be in my nice, warm sewing room doing a video and having a little chat with you guys. So anyway, I'll see you next time. Bye!